Yeah, so like Ed was saying, so I, I, let me just free talk for two minutes or so. I'll talk about the company, how it started. It started in 2016. Uh, it was a desk, uh, desktop printer uh, doing exactly this, but prototyping. And then uh, 2020, uh, before the pandemic hit, uh, Joab Stern became the CEO of the company. And during the pandemic, uh, uh, he, his vision was to always reinvent uh, manufacturing electronics, right? So his vision was this, and he raised 1.5 billion during the pandemic just to achieve this. And during this process, he started to look at other technologies. He didn't want to organically grow the company inward because that takes years to decades to come to where you can actually manufacture electronics. So he started looking at the technologies of where other companies could fit into, and he started acquiring them. So during this time, he acquired five of those companies. And one of them is an AI company called DQ. And it's embedded into all of our platforms now. And within the five companies that he bought, it's embedded into it. Because AI is the way to go. I forgot the individual that said, I guess you said, you know, Amazon knows before you even think of ordering, it's already there. And if you think about AI, the, what it can do, it needs a lot of data input. Once it has that input, it can figure out uh, what you're looking for and what the system needs in order to continue to maintain itself or to continue to run. So, and the other companies are, we'll talk about that, is a micro uh, fabrication company called Fabrica. And then SM Tech is a pick and place and reflow uh, oven SMT line. And then uh, GIS, uh, Global Inkjet Solutions out of London. So with that, yeah. So hopefully during this uh, session, I'll also be able to do a live demo of our system out of uh, Waltham, Massachusetts as well. I have an application engineering manager standing by. He's actually online listening. And also I have a colleague of mine, uh, teammate, Mark Thompson, who is also responsible for the Texas area. Uh, he will also be listening in and joining in. And hopefully if he has uh, anything to say, he will come in on the call as well. So with that, I'll start happy. my presentation. So reinventing electronics industry with additive manufacturing electronics. I was talking to Ed this morning and I let him know that I was at the Rapids show in Detroit and uh, I came back last night, but it's a huge event. I mean, 10,000 people attended, uh, over 200 plus uh, companies were there, big, uh, big footprint. And we were the only company that was doing electronics, additive manufacturing electronics. There was no other vendor that was able to do what we're doing. Uh, there were other vendors there that did uh, aerosol jetting, uh, but they needed something to start with. We start with two materials and we create uh, PCB boards such as this, and uh, such as this, and such as this, an IoT antenna, which is 2.4 gig, right? And Takes two seconds. So, uh, Mr. Fuller had this saying, and this is what uh, one of the things that we're trying to adopt. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And our goal is to do that, to displace PCB. In order for us to do that, we have to be able to show the industry that we are here and we can do exactly what we say. So as I said, our uh, CEO's uh, vision and mission is to reinvent electronics production and specialized uh, mechanical additive manu uh, manufacturing industry to achieve the vision of Industry 4.0. And in order to get into Industry 4.0, you have to transform, you have to create, deploy, deliver, enable, on demand, anytime, anywhere. If you are a designer, you know, electrical, mechanical, if you're a designer, you have your design, but you have to get it to someone. With Industry 4.0, you create the design, you can send it through the internet to the system, and it will start printing it for you. Right? And uh, it will, I don't know if it's well. Yeah. You speak up. <laughs> uh, it exactly. will, yeah. It will allow you to. Uh, get your design or your concept into your hands within hours, maybe a day or so, 
in the today's market, it takes several days to several weeks to get your design into your hands. And again, it, the ROI to our customer share, shareholders is exactly there. We want, like I, as I started with, uh, we acquired DeepCube, which is an AI learning system, which we embedded into all of our additive manufacturing system. Automated Pick and Place, which is our SF Tech company, and HF Systems, which is, as I said, GIS, and then micro additive manufacturing. So, all of this is possible because of the vision of our CEO, who was able to raise that amount of capital. And uh, talking about the current status of the industry, right? Today, it's, uh, it's not eco friendly, poor efficiency, and wasteful, unsustainable. I mean, I mean, everybody talks about being green, but it's very difficult to get there if you don't change. And then slow to production time, high cost, right? And potential for IP theft. I mean, every designer that's here, they always think about if I get my IP out, you know, where is it going to end up? Even if you have an NDA, that doesn't mean the IP is not stolen, right? Right. And then on. excessive energy yes. use, uh, non biodegradable. Uh, material waste. I mean, being in the industry, I'm able to travel to different manufacturing places, and I see this. I mean, thousands of square foot of space is used, and you see the raw material that it's producing and where it's going. I mean, we have no idea where the waste is going. And then uh, detrimental ca carbon footprint. I mean, the government always talks about trying to be green, have carbon uh, credits that you can get, but it's hard to achieve if you, if you don't change the industry. Right. And then uh, uh, today, normal manufacturing could take uh, three weeks plus, right? Depending on what the design is, how many layers you have, they have to turn over the whole assembly line in order for them to produce. This causes delays in ideal and innovation, right? Because you want, if you're the designer, you want your design proved out immediately so that you can get to the market quicker. And then once decided traditional process, complex time, intensive step, all in all, inefficient, uh, a cure of cost. As, as I said before, potential to, uh, for IP theft. I mean, this is the biggest challenge uh, having all of your designs done overseas. You never know who's going to take your design. And they just have to change one thing. And uh, I mean, we can talk about Apple. Apple sued Samsung just a couple of years ago because it's an issue. You know, you could have an IP and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's already established, but when it goes overseas, you never know what happens with your design and who is actually embedding it into their technology. So this is one of the things that we want our systems is able to change, which is to give you uh, that comfortability that your IP stays in-house, right? Industry 4.0 electronics production, right? So this is what we are trying to achieve, right? In order for us to see uh, how our system can enable uh, the companies to be able to uh, assure our local labs to produce small batches, right? Small batch on demand, environmentally sustaining process, intelligent self-improving automation with AI, and radical innovation in the scale and design of products. So you can continue to invent your products as you see fit with the technology that we offer. And as I said, uh, inventing electronics is the core to what we are trying to achieve. We want designers to invent. We want to smart automate self-learning, meaning during that entire process, if you have AI embedded, it can tell you during the process if there is something wrong with the device that it's manufacturing. Either it can repair itself or it will tell you to discard and start all over again. So this way you don't waste time trying to you know, build it out. And sustainable process. Right now in the PCB industry, it's 70 step plus to achieve uh, a board of this size with maybe eight, up to eight layers, right? And then IP security, this is what we offer. And right now from a traditional point of view for proof of concept to prototyping, it takes several weeks. With us, it takes day, hours to days for you to get your design into the system and then uh, proof of the, uh, the design, prototype it, and get it to the tooling or to the market right away. 
we're able to do that. And then uh, complex process, right? I mean, uh, today uh, our 3D printers, the benefits are AMA removes many of the challenge of intense traditional printing circuits, right? I mean, as I said, we can go, if you look, we can go from design to the system, to testing, into shipping. It's a, it's a literally a five step process, whereas traditional uh, manufacturing will take 70 plus uh, steps to get to the board app. And these are the two products that uh, are that we're offering. One is the Dragonfly, which is our AME, uh, which <laughs> is called uh, additive manufacturing electronics. It's a high performance uh, electro electrical device. We call it iPad, iPads and complex circuit boards. As I was uh, discussing with a few of you earlier this morning, we're able to print up to 59 layers in a three millimeter stack. And then our fabric <laughs> system is ultra precise micro AM application, meaning it's, uh, it, it, the resolution on that system is one micron. So you can do mechanical parts within a one micron tolerance. And, and I'll get into the, the specs in a minute. And then with us, with the AME, uh, we are laying uh, the material simultaneously, slice by slice, and curing at the same time. We use UV light, and we use the IR uh, light, uh, IR uh, uh, infrared to cure uh, the materials. The conductive material is with the IR, and the dielectric is with the UV light. And we're able to do it slice by slice as we build up. And as you can see, uh, this is the uh, circuitry as it's printing, uh, as it's printing, you can just start to see how it starts to layer it out. And then, as you can see, the traditional way, the PCB way, you can see it's all two-dimensional. With us, it's three-dimensional. You can reinvent what you have uh, from a form factor. You can reinvent and really do think about fit to form and you know, fit to uh, design to fit. Uh, anywhere you want to go and and uh, here from a PCB perspective we can actually give you the ability to render your drawing and decide where you want to put your uh, either your traces or your vias or your through holes it, it'll give you a, a better perspective on how to reduce the footprint of your design and these are some of the things that I put out there and uh, as I said some of the devices that we have manufactured uh, the proof of the concept from our perspective is like AME circuit capacitors. So we we print capacitors, uh, and then we also print coils. Uh, well, like this, this is one of the coil inductors. We print that. It's part of our system, and we were able to achieve that. And then, as I said, one of the things that I put out there is an IoT antenna, and then uh, we have side mounted. So that's the other part of the, our design is giving you the ability to think outside the box and decide how much space do you want to reduce by mounting uh, either resistors or LEDs, whatever you have. But uh, instead of traditional having it on top, you can put it on the side. You can embed them on the side. This is our stackable uh, vertical stack integration device. This is like for our die. It has multi-level stacking uh, applications that you can do. And I also put one of these out there that you can take a look at. And then uh, one of our other designs is uh, RF antenna, it's a patch antenna. And then there are a few others, uh, complex multi-layer designs you can see. Fill vias, no need for drilling. Everything is one-stop shop. If you think about what the system can do. And like I said, our build plate is uh, 200 by 200, but actual building uh, area is 160 by 160 millimeters and the stack up size is three millimeters. So one of the applications, because you guys are IoT, I decided to add one of the uh, slides with IoT. It's, uh, it's one of the designs that I have put out there. So it's easier uh, for me to show this uh, this uh, because it's an application that you guys can print and, and actually start to use right away because the only after process is adding the components. Today, our material, the DI material, is not good enough to go through a big process because of the 240, 260C needed. 
uh, but uh, we do sell a, a clamp mechanism that allow you to put through the reflow process, but ma majority of the components on here are hand soldered. And then uh, L3 Harris actually uh, did a, an antenna that they sent up into the space. It came back down and they decided to send it back up because it was still functioning. They want to put through more rigorous threat testing. Uh, and uh, we'll get more details on that when it comes back. But uh, one of the, the, the things that you guys, uh, I mean, the industry can do is print our antennas in unique designs. We have some customers that design antennas uh, in pyramid shape. And then there are antennas that they design in sphericals uh, as well to get bidirectional bi signals. And our, uh, to compare us to IPC, I don't think it's the right way, but our uh, testing showed that we are fully capable between 2 gig all the way up to 20 gig where we are matching the DK and the DI. Above that, we, we start to lose some of the signals. So as I said, we the, one of the acquisitions that our CEO did was DeepQ, which is an AI technology. It's it's gathering data, it's processing data, it's training itself, it's validating. So this has already been implemented into some of uh, all of our systems, but uh, it's only doing mechanical. But eventually, it will start to analyze the print itself uh, as we're printing slice by slice or building up uh, through our uh, fabric of the system it will start to uh, look at those layers and decide if it should be uh, repaired or it should be discarded. I think AI is part of what we are going to live by these days. Uh, and then uh, the micro uh, AM part of us is, so we have, with Africa system, it's a micro printer, we use DLP technology. Uh, and we cure with the UV light, and it's uh, building from the bottom up. The build plate is uh, quite uh, small, and uh, but it does unique designs. I mean, it's high precision at one micron, so you are able to do unique designs as well as fit to form. Uh, we have a high resolution uh, ink today, but uh, there are other materials that are coming out, ceramic base and so forth, that will take up to 230 C. So. That's around the road. This is a, a complex device that uh, that was created on that uh, Fabrica system as well. Here's another one. It's a pyramid, and you can see uh, the shapes and the angles that we're able to achieve. Very fine. Uh, it's it's at a micro level. Unfortunately, I didn't bring any samples, but it's at a micro level. That's the percentage. Uh, and you can see the the size difference between the mass tape and the actual uh, layout of many of the devices that it printed. Like I said, the, the build plate is uh, uh, small, but it's exactly what is needed. It's 50 millimeters by 50 millimeters by 100 millimeters. Uh, as I said, the precision is one micro. There's no one in the industry that can be one micro right now. And uh, this is another mechanical micro part that was uh, printed on that device. It's a blade. Family. And then the other company that, uh, that we acquired is a Semtech. It's a pick and place, uh, an inkjet uh, uh, and solar based jetting. Uh, it's uh, one of the systems that eventually will be part of our AME electronics as well, because we want to be able to have a completed board when it's printed. Like there would be no after process. So, as you can see, this is a bare board. This is what we actually print capacitors and oil, but this is a bare board. So once this is done, uh, the end user has to put all the ICs and the resistors, LEDs, and the connector. But that's what we're trying to avoid. We want to embed everything and have a finished board when it comes out. Can you click on it? And then, uh, find, uh, the assembly and, and uh, substrate cavities as well. And dual in inkjet and dual pickup, uh, pick and place systems uh, is part of their, and they also have three dispensing valves that it can do. So the tape and reel, uh, it can go in line into an SMP line and can do that. And they have several models uh, that the end user can buy. 
And then uh, last slide here is regarding uh, our education part of things, which is the AMA Academy. So every two months, we host an AMA Academy where we bring industry leaders to talk about what they're doing. And it's hosted by our uh, CTO, Heimel Bowman, and he is actually having a webinar here at the end of this month. And then we also created a company called Chain. Uh, I actually forget the acronym, but <laughs> yeah, Jared Additive Manufacturing Electronics Source. So this is a joint venture between uh, Nano Dimension and Hansel, and uh, they're based out of Germany. And uh, one of the things that we want to do is give access to the systems that designers can send their files over, and then they're able to print. It's like uh, an innovation center that they can uh, jointly develop uh, any designs that they want. Is there a particular file format? Is it like yeah? The... So we use STL Gerber. So okay, so it's STL format. format. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I do have a live demo that I wanted to do. Uh, one one of the things that I did want to talk about is. Uh, you know, when, when you think about designing a board, right, you actually don't think about all of the things you can do. So we do do unique designs where you can leave cavities open that you can embed in. But eventually what we want to do is leave the cavities open, fill it with the actual component, and then seal it. So this way technology cannot be stolen after this and nobody can break it. Yeah. You guys do any kind of formal code on the final product? Final board. One more time. Do you guys do any kind of formal coding for like environmental protection on the substrate itself or let somebody else do that for you? Uh, I have to come back to you on that. We okay. don't, I don't think we do that. So usually the CM is going to do that. The next step. Yeah. Well, so I, I mean, I realize that's the like way it is in the vision, but it's about breaking the mold of the model. Right. And I don't know if they consider having a formal code capability. I may have to come back to that. Yeah, okay. And we'll change the information later on. Yeah, I can help. Okay, absolutely. So let me see. Are you able to give access to Vulcan? Yes, I can hear you. This is Vulcan FA. I'm joining from Vulcan Boston office. I'm hearing myself. It makes it harder for me to talk. Uh, but I'll try to do my best. <laughs> uh, so I've been with Nano Dimension for about six months and as an RF application manager trying to build up a lab here here to develop custom applications for RF and others. Um, so my background is mostly in antennas and RF circuit design. Uh, worked for companies like Motorola, Raytheon and I was always limited with the, the limitations of the manufacturing, um, traditional manufacturing techniques. And I have, I have always had to design to be able to get the product manufacturable. And with our tools that we have in house right now, we are able to iterate very, very quickly, new designs, custom designs that otherwise you cannot uh, basically uh, even think about. So, let me, okay, this is the first time for me, so be patient. <laughs> so this is from an outside view of our lab that we have been here for temporarily and we will grow this lab into a larger room in this uh, floor. But with this view I wanna just show you, you can just put it in a, in a small conference room, like two of them. Uh, with not too much modification in your facility. Uh, a few things you need to pay attention to is the temperature and humidity settings of, of, the, of the room. It needs to be a certain level of humidity or more. Otherwise, um, there is not much really. Uh, you don't need a clean room any, or anything. So I'm going to walk into the room. If it is too noisy and you cannot hear me, please let me know. Uh, so currently we are running these two printers and they are actually printing. So 
So it all starts with uh, okay, symbols. It's the user interface, the software tool, what we call the flight control, um, where you import your STLs or um, Gerbers and generate with the, the format that the printer works with. You basically load that file into the program here and set up a few things, such as the recipe, the recipe that is ideal for, for your design. You may need to use a custom temperature, uh, depending on the geometry, then you kind of predefine a few things before you uh, hit the run button and the print job starts. So before starting the print, again, a few other things you pay attention to is the calibration of the print heads and uh, the health of the print heads that you check beforehand. And I'm gonna show you. So this is the back door and the printer is running and print up it's supposed to be a dielectric resonator antenna for a customer. Um, so it's not very visible from this view, but as you see, it's going back and forth, and layer by layer, it's a positive thing. If you could, if you could speak up just a little bit, what's happening is his yeah. mic's fighting with the noise there. So I'll, 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 I'll talk. You just uh, put it there. So yeah. Yeah. okay, maybe right maybe I will mute myself and let Peter talk about. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're fighting his yeah. his mic's fighting yeah. the noise. Yeah, well, he's trying, but so the, yeah. these two ink wells right here are for this is our uh, dielectric non-conductive. This is our conductive ink, which is nano silver, and the bill plate has a substrate on it, so it's reusable. That's the Kapton substrate, and then you start to see the devices. So as I said, the white light you see is the IR lamp. It's heating up to 170 as it's curing, and the bill plate is always at 160. So that we manage the thermal uh, temperature throughout the print. And then you have the UV lamp here. Uh, if he moves over a little bit, uh, the UV lamp right there is what we, what, you, what we use to cure the dielectric. And these two things right here are the inkjet print heads that you see. We have uh, a camera system here that uh, the, the deep cube, the AI, is using to calibrate the nozzles and and check the health of it as well and then the deep cube is also doing the mechanical uh checks as well it, you know the wear and tear of the chuck as it's going back and forth and some of the other things this system is self-maintained meaning during the print it goes and cleans itself and then uh through uh, with a ph wash and maintains itself uh, that's how the nozzles don't get restricted uh, so that they have a longer lifetime for it so as you can see, it will do that. Uh, it'll clean itself and then it'll start printing again. While it's idle, it does that as well and during the print. And it looks like it's during the curing, it's doing that as yeah, well? Yeah, it's doing something else. But it's, uh, it's doing a top oven uh, where it's uh, curing a little bit uh, more than what, so it's like right now it's cleaning itself. So the, uh, the pH wash comes through the bottom and then it has a vacuum blade that cleans the group, meaning it cleans the print heads. And it's all fully encompassed, uh, meaning the, the waste, everything is in the contained inside. Nothing is outside. So it's really a factory in a box. So, so how, much, how much of that is off the shelf, whatever 3D printing, how much custom designed by oh. all that? Yeah. Everything is custom designed by us. The inks, everything is by us, except for the print heads. So those are sort of standard. Yeah, it's like Panasonic. <laughs> yeah. Does the process uh, contaminate the air around it no, in any way? No, we have a charcoal filter that takes out any of the hazardous, but there's no contaminants. So there are hazardous. The ink itself is hazardous because of silver. Yeah, the substrate yeah. and stuff. Yeah. yeah, Peter, can you, can you speak to, and I think what you're hearing in a couple of the questions, which is mine as well, is are, 
our frame of reference for 3D printing is what we see in the consumer market. Right. It is not highly repeatable relative to precision structures. And so when you start talking about you know micron level <laughs> fabrication, yeah. you've now moved back into you know almost wafer fabrication from a couple of years back. Right? Correct. So can you speak a little bit more to repeatability of of this type of level of precision and what was involved in getting these plates to move at such yeah it's got to be perfect. I, I guess that's the point. I'm having difficulty with. I'm lost with his understanding. Yeah. You know, in in wafer fabrication, this is all done with lights and lasers. Correct. That's it's like done with mechanical movement at a micron level. So help me understand. What's so our 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 red heads, right? That we use are 100 by 512 nozzles, and the and the precision on our print heads, right, is uh, 18 microns. So the actual the jetting is 18 microns. So as it's laying the the materials down, it's doing it at 18 microns accuracy. Yeah, and then the line width is 75 microns, and the spacing between the line is 100 microns, and our vias are 150, and our ball pitch is 350. So, uh, but as far as the chuck and the movement, that's yeah. all programmed in, right? It, 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 the railing you see on the bottom, it's all calibrated. So. Before it starts any print, it homes itself so it knows where everything is, right? But the precision of that movement and you know any yeah, vibration, that's really, that's it's really crazy. Algorithm. Yeah. It's, uh, so we have encoders that we use. Uh, the, the entire like you can't see it because of this plate right here, but there's an encoder underneath, a uh, very high precision encoder that tracks the movement of the chuck and does the, the balancing as well. Yeah. yeah. We we level everything before we. Uh, print. Okay. Yeah. But does it self balance as it goes? Or? No, oh, no, no. So it stays. Yeah. Okay. So the system has wheels, but we, we have leveling feet that we level the system, you know, part of the installation process. And then once that level, we level the chart, the roof, uh, at, a, at a, like almost like a, a micron level. Okay. Yeah. Because that's the, always the trickiest part of 3D printing is Correct. leveling, right? Yeah. Now, this is why I said this is not a desktop. Printing this is the actual manufacturing system. Yeah. Are we good? Is there anything else you guys want to see? Um, the other thing you mentioned on the the other thing that's commonly fails and like I said, our reference point is more commercial. Yeah. Um, usually, nozzles getting clogged. So, Correct. So yeah. we use uh, to avoid that. We require thirty five percent humidity uh, above uh, in the uh, room. And then we use our pH wash to clean the nozzles every three minutes or so during printing and during idle. So frequent so, cleaning. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's actually jetting the inks and sucking it back. And so our waste from a daily perspective is like one milliliters of CI, two milliliters of DI per day. That's it. So over a course of two to three months, you'll end up with a couple of liters that you'll have to discard. That's why everything is contained within the system. Thank you, Volkan. Awesome. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead and speak up, Mark. Good morning. Is and that... uh, yeah, so great, great uh, presentation, Peter. Thanks for that. Great questions from the audience. Um, one thing I'd like to kind of speak to, I think we kind of merge the two resolutions that you were being asked about the one micron stuff about um and so yeah so on the fabrica side which is our abs uh precision micro 3d printer we do a micro one micron z pull that's what we're able to achieve with that um so realize that's the much smaller build that's at 50 millimeters by 50 millimeters by 100. so we can accomplish one micron z pulling in that uh, volume and then about a 2.9 micron spatial resolution. It's a DLP technology with a projection lens, same semiconductor um, lithography lens. So that's where we get the resolution. But I, I just I, I just wanted to kind of uh, separate the two conversations. We still have very good accuracy on the Dragonfly, but we're printing at much larger um, physical geometries than what uh, the 
the fabric is. And that's, I just wanted to kind of get those two different uh, um, motion systems on the table, if that makes any sense. It no, does, that, 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 was that the confusion? Yeah, that was, uh, okay. for me, that certainly yeah. was part of the confusion for me. Uh, I apologize. The, the so, dragonfly is still pretty impressive. Okay. Sorry. It's, Sorry. But that one micron thing threw me for a second. Yeah. So, so that's with our fabric system. That's the micro precision printing. It's not electronics. It's just as it is. Yeah. So with this, we also introduced a, a software called Flight. And so what we did with the Flight system is traditional electrical engineers don't render into 3D, but mechanical engineers do. So what we do is we take the both designs, combine it, and give a 3D rendering of the design. So this way it gives the conversation to both engineers to talk about how do we reduce footprint? You know, what can we do different? Do we, can we put BS in a, a diagonal 45 degree? We can put a trace 45 degree, save space. This way it gives them conformity. Then our flight software has a third, a second portion called the check. It will check all of your design rules against the design. So like Altium, you can add in for Dragonfly. Right now, we, with Altium and SolidWorks, they have our specs that they can just, you can just plug into the, uh, the software and you can add in for Dragonfly. So these are the only two platforms today that we have it, but we're working towards others. Uh, and then lastly is the control. The control is it converts the Gerber, the SDL into a printable file, PCBJ file, so that you can go ahead and print. So it's really a push to print uh, technology. So once you do all of your pre-checks, you load the file, and then you load the substrate onto the chuck, and then you hit print and walk away. So we, what we do uh, is every eight hours or so, you're just wiping the groups and letting it go. But typically, you can have a 60-hour print uh, for something like this. It will take about uh, 40 hours or so. You send it to print and you come back and it's completely done. And I did bring some brochures for you guys to take and then the samples there as well. Yeah. Yes. So again, Gary Tanel, I've been doing circuit board assemblies for about 35 years and uh, I'm on an international technical team for an association and for the last five years we've had an additive 3D track, 3D printing track of electronics, and Nano Dimensions has graciously come in and done presentations for the, oh, the nice. last five years, so I'm familiar with the Dragonfly machine. The the thing that I'm very pleased to hear that the, the uh, acquisition of Syntec is uh, the, the, the Achilles heel on this, okay, is the, the temperature and the printing and the uh, adhesive paste okay because traditionally uh you can't place second place on angles and on the sides of things it's all 2d correct this actually opens up a tremendous opportunity and dimension there's about six different kinds of, of circuit boards and this particular technology very well fits into rf technology and antennas it's used a lot in satellites, low volume things like that, where you have some very, very unique things. Okay, it's it's not going to replace the the game stations and Xbox and high volume commercial stuff, but for the very unique. And I'm I'm very pleased also to see that the software piece of this is going because until a couple of years ago, uh, you were able to print, you were able to take the Gerber files that the electrical engineers are already very comfortable in presenting and and trying to take a conventional uh, software and conventional technique and use the 3D printing to emulate a conventional 2D thing, which is okay, but I see that as just a step. The avenue that this is in here, if, when you can get to round conductors, diagonal, eliminate the drilling yeah. as, as you have, the impedance control and the RF are, are the big drivers on this. Um, the, uh, the silver is a bit of a limitation, but in the right applications it can. So as you can move on to other materials, that'll help. Uh, lastly, I'm going to add uh, the, the technology we did, uh, talk we did last week is on something called uh, low temp solder. Yeah. Okay. 
low temp reflow. It's down to 220. So that brings in this technology much better because there's a limitation on how hot you can go in the, in the reflow ovens. So because now you have placement, you have the, uh, the solder, and uh, now if you can get the temperature down, it opens it up for some of the things. This is extremely effective for, you know, the engineering models where you have the engineer to finish the design and when he comes in in the morning, the board is done. He can manually place the parts on there to, to do the circuit. So it works extremely well for laboratory kind of environments, small volume, quick turn, you know, kind of thing. So anyway, please see that. No, no, that yeah. So it has evolved, as I said, because of the uh, small acquisitions that our CEO made, but also the capital we raised. So there, there are more acquisitions to be made, strategic acquisitions, so that uh, we can get to that, uh, the heat. Uh, yeah, there are acquisitions that are, will come about. Yeah. yeah, it's cool technology. Yeah, it is. And uh, we can, like I said, like with IoT, you can do low batch uh, manufacturing because it's only 2.4 gig and it's good to go. That's not an issue. Uh, up to 20 gig is not an issue. The DF and the DK is okay. But if once you get above that, yeah. yes. I to hear your comments about improving this product further. You have this. Do you have a virtual model of this, which I can see where improvements can be made? And second, comment by interviewers. How do you make a list on this? Do you have the AI to so, as I said, it was a recent acquisition of DQ uh, with AI, and so it's still learning, and it's still uh, able to give us some data for the nozzles and some data for the mechanical stuff. So we, we today we have regimented maintenance, such as a six months and a 12 months PM that we come in and overhaul pretty much everything, and then re-level, make sure the leveling is good, make sure the print heads are replaced, we do all of that. It's pretty invasive, and so we do do that, and we empower customers to do the three and the nine months. It's just two to three filters that they have to change, but the maintenance side of the uh, of the Dragonfly 4 system is really every two months you're changing two parasitic two and one 10 micron filter, that's it. There's no real maintenance now. It's pretty hands-off. It's kind of cool because it eliminates basically 20 machines in a clean room environment in, in China somewhere. So if you look at the footprint of what this accomplishes versus, you know, you, you need a, a room this size and conventional technology to do, you know, printed wiring for it. So what you can do in one machine. Correct. I mean, that's only maybe two to four layers. This can go up to 59 yeah. depending on what you have. Right. Yeah. Mark, do you want to add anything? No, you're doing you're doing a great job, Pete. Um, you know, I think there's yeah. been some, uh, some great uh, questions, great questions, and uh, and uh, if there's you 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 covered the quantity of layers that we do, so that's good. That's good. And, um, and I think um, everyone's kind of picked up on the acquisitions will be a strategic yeah. and a uh, synergy and, uh, synergy application for us moving forward and how to. To get to that uh, heterogeneous uh, assembly of systems, I guess, is what I would say. So that's uh, that's really where we're going. That makes sense. Yeah. What is the cost price of the units that you are having? Yeah. Yeah. So the question. So what is the cost for the unit? So the turnkey solution is 540k, meaning turnkey that includes starter kit, one-year warranty. Uh, the uh, training, the installation, the shipping, everything included, turnkey, 140. Uh, okay. And the uh, dragonfly? Is there uh, any education? And the dragonfly. Will there be any education in this Yes, ma'am. There will be. Yes. And uh, we, it, it does come with our LMS access as well, our learning management system. Mm -hmm. It's a portal. It has videos, it has all the content for a, a user to continue to learn, evolve their skills. And uh, from an educational perspective, what uh, what Nano Dimension wanted to do is, uh, I, I don't know if you remember, like an apprent apprenticeship. When you graduate from high school, you paired up with an electrician, uh, uh, like a 
master electrician to get your apprenticeship going to become an electrician. So what Nano Dimension wants to do is empower universities, colleges, so that when a graduate graduates, he gets a certificate for this technology that he can go right to work at anywhere that he would like or she would like. And so we're trying to partner with uh, universities. That's why we're strategically based out of uh, Waltham, Massachusetts. So there's a, it's a big college town, uh, MIT, you know, there's a lot of colleges. And so we're building the space that the uh, Vulcan showed. We're building a space that students can come and test their designs, but also get experience with the system. Because we need to grow the labor market as well, not just introduce the product that is cool, that is, you know, can do uh, ready for, you know, industry 4.0, but you need the labor to follow as well. And so this is one of the things that we're trying to do is to achieve that. But we said there's a one year warranty. Yes, sir. So I get one of those and somebody from your company has to service it if something mm -hmm. should go wrong. Yes. So we do empowerment models as well. Uh, after the one year warranty, we want to empower our, our users to be able to do the repair themselves. Okay. And, and so that we, we do offer two type of warranties. Okay. Yeah. Because with anything, that's always when you start to think ahead into year two, three, four, and so on. You know, downtime obviously is a bad thing. Yeah. How much am I reliant on the original supplier yeah. to fix things? If I do monkey with it myself, what level of expertise is needed? Yeah. Can I, you know, trash the whole thing by doing something wrong? You know, that basically I'm in a hurry, I got to get this thing fixed and, you know. I cause it to be, uh, you know, even in even more shape. It just stuff like that starts to. Yeah. So, like I said, a learning management system is one of the tools that we provide to our end users. It talks about installation, talks about PMs, it has videos, it has a lot of content, including for designers, application uh, side as well, and also for uh, future uh, products. So, everything that you need is there. Yeah. One of the things I want to add is that. You know, Nano Dimension is in a the business of selling machines, yes. right? Okay, but some of the universities have been acquiring some of these machines, and industry is partnering with universities to develop the technology and use the technology. So, what I see happening with people, you might want to touch on service bureaus, okay? Yeah. Because before somebody goes out and spends a half a million dollars for a piece of machinery to build circuit boards, okay? Uh, usually they like to go to a service bureau and build that up and then once they get to a volume where they do enough of that then you can justify buying your own machine right correct so can you talk a little bit to how many units are in place in universities and maybe how many service bureaus there are that these people can work with to build up their products so we are a service bureau meaning we are we're able to take a design from anyone and, and do that. And then if the end user likes that particular design and the output, they can place an order with us. So we have big name companies that are doing that as you right. speak. So we did partner strategically with TTM, Time to Market Company. That's the name, Time to Market. So that's our partner. That he's a, They're a traditional PCB house. And what they do is they have three of our systems. They manufacture uh, the product for you on their systems. Either they will continue to do that on the additive side, or they can turn it into a traditional side, depending on what you're wanting. If you need large, like a million uh, boards a month, then they'll have to transition you into their PCB side, right? Otherwise, they'll have to build, you know, depending on the product. Yes. Uh, so you can, you're capable up to 59 layers. And let's say we, we control the substrate size and area. Do you have any figures that would tell you, okay, how many boards can we produce in an hour of two layers? How many boards can we produce in an hour that's three layers? How many boards can we produce in an hour that's four layers? All the way up to the 59. So we can kind of gauge uh, a, a sweet spot where we can make a trade off to buy the machine, go to service bureau, or redesign the board, something like that. So, with the flight software, right, so 17 microns is the layer thickness, the minimum layer thickness. 
So as your thickness gets higher, the layer count goes down. So it's at the designer level, the layers that you want to print out, right? So we give the minimum specs, and then if the designer wants a 17 micron uh, layer thickness, then the number of layers goes down because the build volume doesn't go up. It's still at three millimeters, right? And so on the Dragonfly, I didn't know if you saw the GUI that uh, Vulcan was showing, the GUI will dictate the ink that you're going to spend on that particular build and the design that you're gonna do. So, and then it will also tell you the length of time it will take to print that design. So all of that is done once you load it into the actual printer. It'll tell you exactly the time, the duration, the amount of material that you're going to use. And if you have, so the way to save space, so if you think about the build plate going this direction because the group is this way, right? And if the group stays the same, and you're just going this way, if you print everything in this direction, it, it's the same build time. It's not adding. When the group has to go left to right, then it's going to add more build time because now it's having two axes to move. It increases the build time. Uh, yeah. Are these recyclable to retrieve the silver back? Uh, so <laughs> are these recyclable? So it is hazardous, right? So when uh, EPA company comes and picks it up, I'm sure they reclaim some of that silk. But they put that into the cost. They're not going to give it back. To you. No, sir. By any chance, you collect any operational data from the sensors that might be machine and explore what we do with how we do So yeah, to optimize, right? To optimize downtime. Right? We don't want downtime, I think somebody was asking. So to continually have the system up and ready is the, the end user's goal. We take all that data and try to optimize either uh, changing out the hardware when it's not being used or proactively doing any other activities. So that's what the data is for. And then improve the hardware as we're moving forward. And if the, if the print heads are failing at a large volume, then we'll go back to the manufacturer and say, hey, what's going on here? Why do we have a bad batch or do we need a new design? You know, that data, that's how we use it. And it goes, all of that data is going back to R&D as well to continue to improve the product. We have some kind of cloud-based system. Cloud <laughs> so many of the customers, like IP is an issue, right? So many of the customers do not want to share their data or put their system online. Those customers that do allow us to do that, we're taking that data. Like DOD is not gonna let you do that because they, they want to protect their data. So the customers that are not DOD universities and stuff like this, we're collecting that data and we're using that data, yes. And the second question I have is you mentioned the labor force. What kind of labor force technical skills do you So a technician is able to manage the printer. A technician like a, a, someone that has like a certification, like electronic certification can manage the printer. We provide the training, right? They need to know how to use food drivers, multimeters, and so forth, but we are able to do that. But when you're graduating uh, with a BA degree in electrical engineering, right, and now you're applying for a work, but if you say you have a certification in a certain technology, it's easier. And it also helps us, I mean, there's the other side, right? Now we have someone that knows our technology that will promote our technology as well. So there's two sides to the coin. I just don't want you to think that I'm only looking at one side because we want to empower the labor force. So when you graduate, you know exactly what you want to do because this space is not going away. I mean, like I said, I was at Rapid and you have to see the companies that are out there, what they're doing, especially in the medical space. HP was out there for scoliosis. They're building individual uh, braces individual so they're scanning the patient on MRI and then building out that particular patient's brace customizing it. so the industry is changing and then I walked over to another booth they're building uh, engine blocks you know metal additive manufacturer building engine blocks you know there's some after process but they're building it. traditionally you have to mill everything now they're building it so this industry is going to grow and it's going to just be very distributive. Any other questions? 
Besides so, silver, what other material? Is there any research done to? So there are being uh, there are researches being done, but if universities have material they want to use, what we would like to do is test it, especially for viscosity. It's an inkjet system, so if the viscosity is not right, it will just go right through the printhead. Second, we want to make sure that it's able to cure and adhere to both materials. So the current recipe we have, it allows you to do that. Uh, any other materials that you will introduce, we need to make sure that it can do that. Besides the universities, uh, who would you say are your best, your best prospects for customers? Uh, governments, aerospace industry, uh, uh, automotive industry, medical industry. I mean, the space is uh, phenomenal in terms of where what you can do, especially from a design perspective to market. This is the technology that allows you to do that within days. Because if you want to get to the market quickly before your design is obsolete, this is the technology you need. Sarah online asked, is there any vision system on the machine to detect defects? Yeah, so we have a camera right now. We use it for purely calibration purposes. Okay. Down the road, it will be used for defects, right? Even if the system identifies defect, we're not able to do it except to discard. We want to be able to repair the defect and give the end user the ability to do so, or the system itself. Today, we're using the camera with the AI just for inspection of the nozzles and so forth. Is there any kind of uh, post data input process that uh, after the print's done to kind of Say, hey, this was we found that this was a defective print after the facts that can help train the train the AI data. That is being done in R and D, okay. uh, not on production machines, but in R and D that is being done okay. because it takes it, the pictures. That's how it's being right. trained with the nozzles. That's how we trained. It took a lot, a lot of pictures and thousands of them accumulated, yeah. and now it knows which nozzle is clogged, which one is firing, which one is not. Training is always the hard part on yeah. AI ML, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. One more question? Anybody else? Let's give Peter a hand.